All right, we're going to start. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on uh, the last day of the UNESCO World Press Day conference here in beautiful Punta del Este. Uh, my name is Prue Clark, and I'm absolutely thrilled, A, to be freed from Australia finally <laughs> after two and a half years, but also to join this incredible panel. Uh, I'm a journalist. And I think we all need friends, and especially journalists, and especially now. And this panel is about finding allies and, and working together to galvanise support for press freedom. And I'm so pleased to be joined by three uh, allies to the press freedom movement. Uh, activist, a lawyer, and a donor, who are leaning into uh, the fight to protect press freedom as it tightens around the world. Nathan Law, who's joined us uh, on the screen, is one of the most recognisable faces of Hong Kong's democracy movement. He was a student leader who became the youngest ever elected lawmaker in Hong Kong's parliament. That seat was overturned and he was jailed in 2017, and he fled Hong Kong in July 2020 when China imposed the national security law. He's now won asylum in the UK from where he joins us today. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you. Sarah Hussain is going to join us, I'm told, um, so we'll look forward to seeing Sarah. She's a groundbreaking lawyer in Bangladesh, a barrister at the bar of the Supreme Court. She's been a key driver of changes in law that impact women and backsliding in democratic freedoms across the subcontinent. She's been fighting the, f the fight and the legal wave of eff legal efforts being used to silence journalists in the subcontinent. And finally, I'm joined uh, on the stage here by David Sasaki. He's a program officer in the Gender Equity and Governance team at the William and Flora Hewlett, Hewlett Foundation, where he supports organisations that improve government responsiveness uh, to underserved communities. So welcome, David. Um, I'm also... I'm a journalist, uh, and I run an organisation called New Narratives, which is uh, designed really to, to disrupt the media development model around the world. We fund great journalism in low-income countries uh, by the leading media houses there, and also innovation. And I'm going to uh, weigh in here as well with some thoughts on how uh, the international development community, many of you out there, can be more helpful to media. So um, let's start with Nathan. I want to start by expressing sympathy, um, I think, from everybody for what you've been through in the last few years. I was actually in Hong Kong in 2019 for those incredible democracy movements, march, the march with millions of people. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, some massive percentage of the population turned out in solidarity um, to to demand democracy and protect their rights in China, uh, sorry, in Hong Kong. Um, it must have been wrenching for you. Can you give us uh, an overview of what's happened to the press and, and why that matters? At the Center for International Media Assistance. Um, for me, it's really crucial that we have um, uh, uh, media freedom and press freedom in Hong Kong. Uh, the uh, Reporters Without Border just uh, released um, their well uh, uh, press index yesterday, and Hong Kong for now is ranked 148th out of 180 country, and uh, it is the historic historical low, and it is even lower than Uganda and Singapore. And this is not the Hong Kong that we used to recognize. Just a decade ago, Hong Kong was still the, one of the freest city in Asia, and we were proud of our um, free speech, um, um, freedom of political action, assembly, and freedom of our political participation, um, even though we have never been a democracy, but we still have a certain degree of freedom. And it applies to, to press freedom. Um, but for now, we, we can easily recognize that the laws of press freedom is definitely one of the mechanisms that um, an authoritarian state wanted to crack the civil society and to suppress democratic movement. Um, so the core of uh, the democratic movement is the people. People have to think freely. People have to receive information about government's practice. And most of the time, um, 
their corruption, their misbehaviors, and and the thing is that really signal a poor governance, so that the people could think and organize and to react to these problems. But if we do not have a free circulation of information, then those people cannot be provoked to think or cannot have a channel to discuss freely, then it is really difficult to organize activism. And that is what the government wants. Um, so you can see in man in China, in North Korea, in authoritarian states, um, press freedom is severely suppressed. Truth is no longer accessible for the people and people cannot build their actions on top of the facts and truth. And that is why uh, press freedom matters a lot and why when resistance movement are ongoing, um, free flow of information is so important. For me as an activist, of course, um, I'm not a journalist, but I, I do um, really feel like sometimes they are journalists are being pushed to a level that they have become dissidents rather than they chose to do so. Um, just look at Hong Kong. In my new book, Freedom, How We Lose It and How We Fight Back, I dedicate a chapter about the press freedom in Hong Kong and um, kind of lay out the mechanism that the Chinese government, the Hong Kong government used to suppress our press freedom. For example, um, disbanding news agency that dare to challenge the government, jailing journalists, um, banning all the techniques and, and, and measures that investigative journalists could do uh, to investigate government's uh, malpractice. All these are, are things that took place in Hong Kong in the past year. And as part of the big operation of silencing Hong Kong's critics and depriving people from their basic human rights. And many of the journalists are actually our friends. Uh, we, 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 we talk about things. Um, sometimes they interviewed me and um, it's really crucial for them to have an environment to operate freely, free from the threat of the government. But sadly, this is no longer the case in Hong Kong. And if we take it and to examine in a broader sense, there's definitely uh, a lot of these things, similar things happening around the world. And for me as an exile activist, I left Hong Kong because that is the only way I can speak on this forum and publicly about uh, the human rights violation in Hong Kong and in China. If I were to do it in Hong Kong, I would be immediately put in jail because of the national security law, which it criminalized free speech and put people who criticize the government in jail. Um, so for me, it, it's really important for me to continue to speak up for journalists in Hong Kong and the environment there. I do not believe that without uh, uh, press freedom, the kind of international financial actor of Hong Kong will sustain and it will face a lot of challenges and the city will fall if we do not have the support of a press freedom of a society that we can circulate information freely. We so saw, at the end of the day, a, I hope um, sorry by to our interrupt you, but efforts, we, saw we a can lot safeguard of not only journalists, their safety, their, their well-being, but also a civil space that we can share information, that we can circulate information, thus to bring some actions and to remind ourselves that we deserve a better government, we deserve a free society. Thank you. Thank you. We saw the story of Jimmy Lai and Apple Daily News became a very big story about a year ago. What's what's the latest in terms of the Hong Kong media, but also all the international media? It used to be the hub in China, of, uh, sorry, in the Asian region for international media. What's happening there and, and, and what, what's the impact in Hong Kong? Jimmy Lai is a media tycoon in Hong Kong. He ran a press called Apple Daily, which is the largest independent and pro-democracy newspaper in Hong Kong. It was shut down last year, and uh, it was obvious that uh, the government was behind it, and um, it was a listed company, and it could be shut down in, in a matter of weeks, and Jimmy Lai himself become the target of the government. He is now in jail for more than a year and a half, and we are expecting the government would put him in jail for decades or even life sentencing uh, if he is being sentenced um, at the maximum sentencing of the national security law. And he had been um, a boss of a media company 
and the government chose to do it because they recognized how powerful uh, a free press is and how pro how powerful truth could be, and they wanted uh, Jimmy Lai to be an example of um, how and what would uh, the consequence be if you dare to speak truth in Hong Kong. Um, so that was what happened to Jimmy Lai and to Apple Daily. And in general, many of the big independent uh, press in Hong Kong have disbanded. It is not only um, the, the, the chilling effect uh, does not only apply to local press, but we have seen a lot of international media like New York Times, um, which they used to have their Asia headquarters in Hong Kong. Now they're gradually moving out of Hong Kong to Taipei, to, uh, to, to, to Seoul, to, to Tokyo. And um, they also feel the heat of the national security law. Therefore, um, many of the other journalists um, in protecting their own personal safety have to leave Hong Kong. And that um, hub of uh, media, that nature of Hong Kong has already gone. All right, thank you. David, uh, obviously the role of donors is incredibly important in this area. What are you seeing and, and uh, how are you finding ways to be most helpful? I don't know that I would agree that the role of donors is so important in this area. I think that we've really seen how limited our influence is over the past uh, 10 years. And Nathan's comments underline for me that if there was ever a time when we could take as inevitable the forward march of liberal democracy, I think the last decade has really disabused us of, of that inevitability and in that we've seen backsliding in so many different places um, across the broad, across the you know, regions and then also types of countries, um, democracies that we thought at one point were very strong. So in terms of our modest contribution from Hewlett Foundation in partnership with a lot of other peer funders that can be difficult to coordinate with because there are so many of us, we're basically supporting liberal democracy as uh, a means toward well-being and inherent dignity of all people. And we do that through three pathways, which I think are actually represented in, uh, in this conversation. One is through public interest media, especially in representing voices and communities that tend not to be represented in the press. Uh, another means is through legal advice, free legal advice, so that all people have equal access to justice and the protection of the law. And then finally through citizen movements and activism, uh, like the type that Nathan has been leading, um, especially for democratic and, and liberal norms. When I started working at Hewlett Foundation six and a half years ago, our team that I work on uh, was funding annually and continues to between 35 and $40 million a year, which felt like an enormous amount when I came to the foundation. And now it feels like such a small drop in the bucket, in part because other philanthropists have entered the stage. And Mackenzie Scott now has given more than $12 billion just in the past two years alone. Um, but also because the more time that you have working, or the more time I have had working in this space, the more I've realized um, just how small that financial contribution is for the work that needs to be done to, to fortify each of those three pathways. So in, within public interest media, our geographic focus is East Africa, West Africa, and Mexico. There are so many issues and problems from press reliance on government advertising, which leads to editorial interference. I mean, there have been panels at this conference, I think, explaining and going into depth about each of the different issues that needs work. And so when we're thinking about $5 million roughly per country to civil society organizations in those countries, it, it just doesn't get close to covering what needs to happen. One thing that gives me a lot of optimism, despite the pessimism of where liberal democracy seems to be going over the past decade, is that as I travel to the countries where we fund groups, I see a level of talent and commitment, especially from a younger generation of uh, digitally native activists and leaders of institutions that I did not see 10 years ago. Um, and it makes my job very easy to fund groups that are doing excellent work However, over the past 10 years, two-thirds of our funding had gone to international organizations based in New York, Washington, D.C., and London. 
that would come into countries, partner with some local groups for maybe a year or two, do project funding through a contract, and then oftentimes leave to the next story. Whatever was in the news, whatever donors were interested in, that's where they would do their work. And there wasn't long sustained patient support of civil society organizations that are locally led, locally based, and locally governed. We're trying to make up for that now. So going forward, we just released a new strategy. We're trying to flip the ratio of funding and have at least two thirds of our funding go to locally based, locally governed organizations in those countries. Um, and I, it gives me optimism that I see this, this so-called localization strategy happening at a lot of different funders and bilaterals. So it's early days. Any indication whether that strategy, which I obviously support, <laughs> is working? I would say so. I mean, I, when, when I read, and this is based anecdotally on reading grant reports and annual reports from organizations, um, but when I see some of the work that's done by our partners like Barraza Media Lab in Kenya uh, is, has been launching, um, they have this amazing group of young Kenyan podcasters. If you go onto their website, you can see a link and subscribe to some of these podcasts. I subscribe to them. It, they're able to uh, organize, they have their podcasts, and they're able to organize these Twitter spaces conversations where literally thousands of Kenyans come to talk about governance issues of the day. We found another group in Ghana called Media Foundation for West Africa that works across Anglophone and Francophone uh, West Africa. And the support that they're able to give to local community radio stations and have partnerships that go across years and not just six months, um, I think that's much more impactful than the type of work that we were doing before, which was much more around multilateralism, kind of global principles, global norms, which is an important part of the work, but it's not close to the ground, close to the impact. So one of the challenges for global donors has been to... Uno de los desafíos para los donantes uh, globales ha sido encontrar esas organizaciones locales. Es un hecho que las organizaciones también van a hacer un cambio y eh, encarar lo que, lo que está de moda entre los donantes. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo se enfocan ustedes en cómo abordan este tema? Para mí esto es una, una excepción. Yo no voy en realidad a las conferencias internacionales. Me gusta salir ahí afuera y estar con las personas. Entonces es mucho más fácil darle una donación de dos millones de dólares a una organización grande que diez donaciones pequeñas a organizaciones pequeñas. Entonces, lo que tenemos que hacer es juntarnos con otros donantes y ver cuáles son los criterios que están aplicando. Estoy de acuerdo con eso. ¿Cómo lo hacemos? Bueno, de la manera que sucede la rendición de cuentas, es el papel de la comunidad de interés público. Muchos eh, donantes se publican las los fondos que tienen. Eh, hay oficiales, eh, funcionarios que están en Twitter. Eh, no, pero no hay una cobertura de la industria de la asistencia. ¿no? Mm, hay algunas, sí, este, hay, hay algunas críticas buenas, positivas de, los, de donantes y fondos. Nosotros por ejemplo, eh, financiamos eh, grupos de podcast este, que a, pensamos que hacen nuestro trabajo mejor. Mm, tenemos a Sara eh, con nosotros. Sara is able to join us. Um, I'd love you both to answer this question about why, why, how, how you see your role as being an ally to to the free press movement and to journalists and ideas you have for galvanizing support among among others what what sings and resonates with people do you think nathan um well as an exile activist is it really difficult for us to um have interaction with on the ground people because we have already left our land it is a bit easier than that case ago because we've got internet, we've got social media that we can interact with people on the ground. But in general, if we wanted to push forward um, campaign or discovery over government mal malpractice, um, media and press uh, have always been a crucial part in the formula. And if we do not have that room or have that freedom for the press to do it, then uh, for me as an activist, it's uh, really difficult to galvanize support um, on the ground. And it all has to rely on our own social media exposure, which is always limited. Um, so it's really, it's really important for us 
um, to try to protect that space and to let journalists who can um, do better work to operate there. And in the context of Hong Kong, after numerous um, free media have been uh, ordered to disband, uh, we've seen a growing trend of um, journalists operating individually. Um, they have their Twitter account or their, their Facebook account, and they try their best to uh, be a person who go to the ground to report or analyze the um, political situation in Hong Kong. And basically, it's like a one-man band doing everything. Um, I think this is uh, one of the adaptation um, journalists made in Hong Kong in order to kind of adopt the latest situation where the government is so suppressive towards organization, organizational efforts, and for them being a, 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 a brand of themselves may help circumvent certain risk that may be imposed by doing real journalism. Um, so I, I think this is a, a way for, for um, a lot of Hong Kong journalists to try to get used to the new norm. But at the end of the day, we, we still need a, a, a structure, we still need a team to work on. Uh, that is how we can produce um, better analysts and better news. There are many groups of Hong Kongers, uh, some of them, uh, who are uh, journalists, who were journalists before, and, and then they left Hong Kong, and then they relocate to the UK and to elsewhere and try to start a new media. It is, of course, uh, difficult to do um, on-the-ground reporting, um, but they can also do um, a lot of uh, analysis, uh, providing platform for columnists who are also forced to leave Hong Kong and also report international news in a way that suits uh, their appetite and uh, in a framework that local people, uh, Hong Kong people, could easily digest and understand. So I, I think um, even though we have a shrinking space for media in Hong Kong, uh, there are a lot of adaptation ongoing, and their work should be supported, um, but not they, their work are not necessarily being covered by a lot of grants and a lot of donors now because they just evolved into a new form in order to get used um, or to, to, to find some of cracks in the system to operate. Uh, David and I were talking about this earlier, this new, the change in the business model in media that has been really led by big American media houses where they are, instead of taking funding primarily from advertising, they are looking to, to the reader to generate revenue. And it's had this knock-on effect of... Uh, forcing the media to make the case to the public about why they're important and also earning their trust and doing, uh, going to extraordinary lengths to do transparent journalism, trustworthy journalism that persuades the audience that they're indispensable and they need to, to fork over cash to keep them going. Do you, I mean, that happened in America because it had this very big challenge to democracy that is obviously ongoing. Um, I don't, I, you know, coming from Australia, I, I think this is not happening. We are not seeing these same uh, campaigns by media houses and democracy activists arguing for the role of the media in the same way that we're seeing happening in the US. Are you seeing that? How is that happening in a Hong Kong context? Or is it stamped out completely by the Chinese government? That was a roundabout question. I guess I'm trying to ask you: Is there, is there, do you, is there a campaign to argue for the for the importance of independent media that that can galvanise the population? Um, well, of course, the context of Hong Kong and China is completely different. There's a huge internet firewall in mainland China. They censor everything. They block everything. Even though for now, uh, when their lockdown in Shanghai is so draconian and making Basically, millions of people out of food and out of proper care. Many need um, to rely on themselves for weeks. Uh, they have also blocked not only political speeches, but also um, circulation of information of the reality in Shanghai in their own internet. So that is uh, definitely uh, another scope of censorship and a really close space for, for journalists um, there. Indeed, we need uh, 
strong journalism, independent journalism, in order to expose these things, in order to report the truth. Um, but we can also suspect that it's really difficult to do it in China, especially with those internet firewall, with those censorship, and with those harsh punishment. If they realize, discover that journalistic um, uh, workers in in China that they're collaborating with um, outside uh, uh, donors or organizations, um, so it is a, a much more thinner line to walk in mainland China. But in Hong Kong, definitely, uh, we also have seen a lot of journalists facing these kind of pressure. But at least we have an open internet for now um, that we can channel a lot of things back to Hong Kong from elsewhere, and we can uh, we should definitely have media to cope with that situation and 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 building up a strong network um, of, of them to try to make things work, even though um, they base outside of Hong Kong. Um, so that there's a huge potential that we should develop, and I do believe that it re- it, it is definitely helping um, us to understand the local context, local situation of Hong Kong, helping the world understand the situation of Hong Kong, and also uh, helping Hong Kong people to understand about the world. Because for now, um, the press in Hong Kong, they rarely report uh, news that, well, Beijing doesn't like, or they would write news in a way Beijing likes. It really severely could tell the way um, Hong Kong people know about the world without that kind of information. So um, I, I believe that is a huge potential for us to help craft um, a better society by having stronger um, media organization um, from outside of Hong Kong. David, you're based in America, so you're seeing this um, movement defending the media uh, up close. Can you reflect on that versus what you see in the countries where you donate? Yeah, um, I think I often fall into the trap of seeing journalists as perfect people. <laughs> it's like values-driven, hardworking, super intelligent, and underpaid. And those are my type of people. Um, but it's important to be realistic that not everything is perfect in press land either, and that there are cases of media houses that are dependent on their revenue from government advertising and from private sector advertising. And as a result, sometimes they don't publish great investigations that have been done by journalists because the publisher or the editors killed the story because they know it would hurt their um, their revenue. Or that the publisher is friends with someone who's on the board. This, this is something that we see. Journalists oftentimes in many of the places where we fund are so poorly paid that they go to cover events where there are free lunches, where they are paid money to cover the the event. Um, and so sometimes they become purveyors of public relations of organizations, including nonprofit organizations, rather than gaining the public's trust through objective, nonpartisan reporting. Um, on top of that, I think in many of the countries that we fund, so Kenya, um, Tanzania, Mexico come to mind, current leaders and recent leaders have been very successful in delegitimizing civil society and public interest media as being foreign run, foreign funded, um, peddling a, a Western worldview. And they've been successful at that because oftentimes these organizations are dependent on, on foreign funding. It's, it's true what they say in terms of where the money comes from. Um, and so what can we do about this? As a program officer, I think the two things that I'm most focused on are asking the organizations that we fund, do they have a published code of ethics on their website? Are their employees trained about their code of ethics? What is that code of ethics? I, we don't impose what it, it, what it should be. We certainly don't impose what they ought to be covering or how they ought to be doing their job, and I'm concerned about funders who do do that. Um, but we want to know that there's a code of ethics there. The second thing is pushing these organizations with questions about their revenue. And is it possible to get to the point where their readers, their listeners, their viewers value public interest media enough to pay for it? 
and oftentimes they say, oh, this is impossible. The work that we do is, you know, the, the vegetables of democracy. People aren't willing to pay for it, but there's demand for it. And I say, if there's demand for it, then I don't think that you're actually going out there and asking your readership what it is that they want. And this is where I've seen some organizations, mostly in wealthy countries, but I've seen it successful in Brazil as well, a semi-wealthy country, um, convince readers to pay for their subscriptions. I think that this is crucial and um, I would like to see much more media organizations asking themselves, what is it that our readers want? How can we provide a service to them that they would be willing to pay us money for? It's going to give them more independence. It's going to build trust. There are, I can only see upsides with it. I couldn't agree more. And I mean, one of the reasons I started New Narratives was I turned up to a, a press conference by UNICEF in Ghana, 2004, and they gave me an envelope stuffed with cash because it was so pervasive that they just expected every journalist there would actually be, be on, you know, taking, taking money. And so the business model is that the journalists make the income, their income from the people they write about. Now, there are some great media houses across Africa and in other places, parts of the world that have made a point of, of, of ensuring that they pay their journalists to be independent and um, uh, ruling that they can't take those sort of payments from newsmakers. And they are setting a higher standard for journalism in their countries. So in West Africa, we have Premium Times, we have Joy FM in Ghana, Front Page Africa, with, with which we do a lot of work in Liberia. And um, it's, it's about sort of setting a higher standard for journalism and encouraging, incentivizing um, a, a more positive marketplace where good journalism is rewarded with higher income. Yep. So Can I play a devil's yeah, advocate please. and push back on this? So what is the difference between UNICEF giving journalists money to show up and report on some event and some of these media houses, um, I won't name names, but a lot of them receive funding from Gates Foundation to report specifically on gender or on health and say, if you report on these topics, we'll fund you to do it, otherwise we won't. I'll tell you why. Um, as you know, in, in, in America now, great swaths of funding actually comes from philanthropy for journalism. And, you know, the media houses have to push back and say, you can't tell me how I do this, but it's a source of revenue to do good independent investigations. What happens with the, the way the model works now is you turn up to a UNICEF press conference and you're expected to rewrite the press release or just single source parrot what they wrote. And so your incentives are all about making nice with the development agencies. And, I, and not actually doing anything that, that your readers care about, not finding out what do my readers care about. Now, you know, ideally the money doesn't come from gates tied to just health or whatever, but you can't deny that health is a massive subject and there is no funding to cover that if it doesn't come from gates. And as long as gates is not, as long as they're transparent about where the funding comes from and uh, they push back on gates and say, you can't tell us how to report this and they're doing good important reporting. That's far better than the way that the model is now. And I, I agree with you, but I actually think that one massively untapped um, opportunity, too, um, in media in low-income countries is um, the diaspora, which are um, relatively wealthy and, and hugely dependent on these media houses for their income. And you can ask them for $20 a year, and it can be game-changing income if thousands of them actually pay. So I think, I think digital revenue is going to be really important going forward. Um, but the second one is, in a lot of these countries, the uh, d development community is a huge percentage of the income, of, of, the, of the GDP of that country. And the donors at the moment, or the aid agencies, pay these brown envelopes, which distorts the market. I plead with the development community to either pay for advertising, pay for your press releases to run as press releases, and, and fuel a more legitimate, um, effective marketplace and do it in media houses that are serious about developing an independent business model. Don't do it with the ones that are funded by, you know, a, a politician or some, some business crony. Um, but also think about going to th organisations like New Narratives that are funding philanthropy money to support independent journalism. We, a lot of our donors are thematic. 
um, and, I, and I hear your concerns about that. Some of them are not. They just want to support good journalism. But as long as you have the guardrails, I mean, uh, you know, ProPublica, all of these great American um, newsrooms have proved that you can do it without it influencing your reporting. Um, so I think there is, there is an opportunity there. Um, I do want to um, have time for questions, but we've been, I'm so pleased to have Sarah join us. Uh, thank you for joining us. I know you've got a hectic day there in Bangladesh today. But um, we're, we'd really love you to talk about the legal aspect of this. Obviously, um, as democracy has, has been backsliding across the world and especially in the subcontinent, the use of um, laws and lawsuits to deter quality journalism and to encourage um, self-censorship has become more of a problem. So I'd love you to talk about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thanks so much for bearing with me and my travails today. Um, yeah, I'm going to speak from the perspective of Bangladesh, where I practice, um, as a private lawyer, but also with um, also associated with a number of human rights initiatives and legal services initiatives. And one of the things we've seen, um, not only in Bangladesh, but very much in our region in South Asia, is the use of laws to harass um, journalists in particular, citizen journalists, and of course human rights defenders. And it's a, there's a kind of plethora of laws. There's a whole range of them which are kind of colonial era laws, you know, laws on sedition and defamation that come from 19th century penal codes. And many of them have been have migrated and sort of transitioned into post-independence, post-colonial uh, kind of shiny new laws, um, which particularly address online speech, but using the concepts from these colonial era laws. Um, and sometimes actually, unfortunately, taking them even further and making them even more draconian. So perhaps the most notorious example um, from Bangladesh is uh, the set of laws we have around online speech, the previous Information Communication Technology Act and now the Digital Security Act, which criminalizes, amongst other things, a quote-unquote propaganda against the history of the Liberation War, propaganda against the national anthem, uh, annoyance of other persons, and then again, direct sort of, um, as I said, transition and migration from previous things, a so-called hurting religious sentiment, often described as a, a blasphemy law that isn't quite that. Um, so these laws have been used very widely um, to suppress speech and, as I said, to really harass people who are seen as, as either as political dissenters or critics or often just, you know, ordinary citizens engaging in very mild political commentary. We saw during the COVID period, for example, um, journal, citizen journalists who re were reporting on government COVID responses being hauled up under these laws. In one case, um, Mushtaq Ahmed, the sort of writer and blogger, died in prison uh, without bail for after months and months in, in prison. Obviously, this kind of context creates a, a, you know, not just a chilling, almost a freezing effect on freedom of speech. So not only journalists, but... Uh, um, we said ordinary citizens who would otherwise be commenting in social media, blogs, and otherwise, um, clearly feel that effect and are silenced. In addition to that, we see a kind of unspoken censorship. So uh, people are kind of informed or know and understand who can be invited to speak, who can be invited to editorialize um, in newspapers, but particularly in electronic media. Uh, and I think this, this kind of approach of the self-censorship of approach, the intimidation, knowing what the limits are. When a society starts to understand that, I think we can see that that has you know, a really uh, profound impact, where particularly in a society like ours and in a, in, a, in a region like ours, where protest and a resistance have been very much part of our history, you know, our histories of independence and anti-colonial movements, also more recently histories of uh, democratic movements. But we're seeing now, in a, we're in a very, very different space where that kind of protest and resistance is very dangerous and where it's no longer enabled by a kind of free media environment uh, or freer media environment. Uh, and at the minute, I think we see in our context, where particularly sort of guardian institutions, um, courts and so on, are very much facing erosion in terms of their independence. The media is still very much the space we have where it's possible to speak about issues, where it's still able to mobilize um, citizen engagement in response um, but it's, it's a massively narrowed space and a massively uh, kind of truncated space. And, and I think that's where we really see the threats. And that's why the need for 
support and, and solidarity across borders is more urgent um, than ever before. What is the uh, attitude amongst the population to journalism? Is there a an appreciation or a movement to uh, in, help the population understand the importance of a free press? I think that there are there are certain media houses that are still very, very trusted and people do look to them. People do look to the media and they look to the sources of news that are seen as more independent. There was a time back in the military days um, when we would, for example, only listen to the BBC. It's, it's not quite that bad, but it is a little bit like that, that we still look at now these outside sources as being more uh, um, more independent in some cases. There are some well-known independent sources inside the country, but there's been a great deal of capture and co-optation of the press. So you see, for example, many, uh, much of the electronic media, and uh, you see actually uh, one of the things we often hear is that we have, you know, we, we have so many different newspapers, we have so many television spaces, uh, stations, there are so many online sites. How can anyone say there's lack of freedom of expression? But many of those are associated with leading political, with, with political figures or their families or their business associates. And many of them are not independent at all in how they function. We've also seen a very, I think, frightening development of um, sort of shadow um, ownership of all kinds of, of media sites, and particularly online media sites, which have um, connections with powerful political actors and, and that you know, really troll and, and harass in a major way Again, people who are seen as critics or dissenters. And and do you do you get a sense that there's an erosion, in of trust among the population in the media in general, or is, are there numbers to show this? I don't think that there's an erosion of trust in the media in general. As I was saying, in some ways, because other institutions in which in a democratic society one should have trust, for example, judiciary or parliament, and so on have faced so much uh, internal implosion or external assault. Um, the media is still, I think, you know, as the fourth estate, is still an institution in which people have trust. But we have also seen this capture of large sections of the media. So it's not, I think I can't give you a, a you know, there's not a monolithic response to that in a way. It's more nuanced and it kind of depends on, on which space you're talking about, whether it's electronic or press or whatever, there are trusted media houses, and but there is also there is at the same time an erosion, I think, of trust as well because it's such a mixed environment. It's not so clear any longer who's speaking and for whom. And and what is the what is the outlook going forward? Um, I think the outlook is bleak, but we have to obviously confront that and. Um, I think maybe in some paradoxical way also, I was going to just wanted to mention something about social media. So, you know, we're obviously all very aware of many of the dangers and risks inherent in social media, but I think in a context of, of shrinking civil society space, in a context of eroding, erosion of institutions, um, in that context, at least in ours, we can see social media also provides very important outlets for organizing and for uh, for organizing and for expressing, you know, commentary and engaging in political discourse. So, again, some of the new developments we're seeing around um, in the name of regulation of online harms are also potentially quite problematic. There is a need to address, certainly, some online harms, but we're also seeing that there are very um, overbroad efforts to do this, which would end up um, also affecting a space where there is you know, citizen discourse and debates going on at the moment. So I think we're seeing a, a bleak environment and one where there's more and more effort to clamp down and restrict the speech that can happen. But I think um, given the kind of space we're in today, where I think we are talking about how we organize and how we mobilize, um, I don't want to end by saying it's only a bleak, bleak picture, because I think that these kinds of efforts for us to connect and to learn about each other's context and to respond and develop responses that are very, very context specific, that understand exactly what's going on, are really what we need very urgently. All right, I'd love to invite questions from the audience. Maybe just have a think about it and what, what I'll ask um, our panelists, what is the, the sort of low hanging fruit, the most important thing that the international community or, or it could do to help, or the most promising thing you can see. 
Nathan? Uh, um, well, I, I think uh, different places have definitely different contexts. Um, I can see a parallel comparison of um, the media in, in China, like uh, what Sarah said in Bangladesh, that there are so many options, but many of them are from the Chinese Communist Party, which they have total control over what kind of news that they produce and what kind of angle that they are going to use. Um, so that is definitely not uh, a free press in, in its sense that we can have a critical mindset towards the government and we can challenge the decision. Um, I think nurturing that kind of um, understanding in a non public, um, making people to understand that um, having choices doesn't mean that they have a freedom of press because there are just lack of that fourth estate power in this uh, media and also um, for the context of Hong Kong supporting uh, media outlets that are outside of Hong Kong, uh, far from the threat of the national security law and focusing on reporting um, things that are important for the civil society. I think the, these are, are, are different options um, to help to build um, a, a better landscape for the free press in different contexts. Sarah, do you want to add to that? Oh, we may have lost her. Yeah. David, how about you? Uh, the, definitely no one thing or, or anything I would consider low-hanging fruit. I think all of it is pretty high-hanging and that there's a lot of work to be done. But there are things that give me hope. So there was an access to information bill in Kenya's, in Ghana's parliament for over 10 years until it was passed. But civil society kept putting pressure. There was a real citizens movement to pass it. It was finally passed a year or two ago. And now a number of organizations have recently used that act to request information from the government about why and how radio stations get public licenses to broadcast, something that the government did not share before. And has generated a lot of interest in why are these certain groups, I mean, Sarah was talking about shadow ownership of media companies. We see this all over, and uh, it's good to know who owns public media. Uh, I think we're seeing this in the US too, where there's a lot of wealth that is now taking over um, media that has been long established. So that's one thing. The last thing I want to point did, can out. I, before you leave that, yeah. did the government actually provide the information? Because that's they, the they next provided part. some of the information, and then there's a request for even more detail, and then they've been resistant to that. Um, it's going to play out over a long period of time. The fact that there is sustained attention on the issue from the media, of course, because they have an interest in this, but also from the public, I think, is a good sign. The fact that you can even make the request that there's this bill that supposedly the government needs to follow, I think, is a real um, is important. It should be celebrated, and we shouldn't. I, I do get concerned when we're so disappointed by the backsliding that we kind of throw our hands up in the air and say, "This is so tough, we can't do anything." Because there are things that can be done. So in Tanzania, also. A lot of what Sarah said about this um, self-censorship and fear of reporting on issues like corruption or human rights abuses that absolutely took place during the Magafuli administration in Tanzania. Four newspapers were shut down, a bunch of bloggers, you had to pay $1,000 to register just to be a blogger, and then people were thrown in jail. Those newspapers are now back. Um, they are no longer illegal. Uh, I think people feel much more free to, to speak out and they're kind of testing the limits of, of what's possible. So it's not all a bad story. And I think there's another thing, and the last thing I'll mention that gives me hope is that criticism, recent criticism of the media, and this includes in Tanzania and Ghana and Kenya and a lot of other places, in Mexico for sure, there's a criticism of the media as being too elite that they are based in the wealthiest neighborhoods of the wealthiest cities and they don't really represent a public. And I think that the media is finally getting sensitive to that criticism and they're starting to go out there and do the reporting in rural areas, getting to know those communities, having partnerships with local media organizations. That is a great thing. Um, and I think we need more of it. We're gonna have a plurality of voices. In this conversation, I think we focused a lot on kind of traditional media, and there's a whole question about that Sarah touched on of how this is evolving so quickly that is, I think, more high-hanging fruit. But there are these little signs that are really giving me hope. Yeah. No, I would definitely agree with that. All right, audience, any questions there? Self-censorship. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, look, I would 100% agree with that. We haven't really talked about social media um, 
which has had a, an incredible chilling effect in, in many ways um, because of the threats and incitement to violence and all the rest um, and the disinformation. But um, that digital space, you know, as we've seen across the world, has provided so many opportunities and so many um, uh, opportunities to serve audiences who weren't being served by the mainstream media. Um, so I definitely would, would agree with you on that positive. Um, I'm, I'm uh, just wondering how much longer we have. So I think we've gone over, uh, yeah. A few more minutes? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, Nathan, um, it just, it does look, it looks from, from the outside very, very bleak. Um, wh what are you focusing on now? Um, is there anything that's uh, giving you hope? Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. It's definitely a difficult question. Um, we are just like walking into the dark tunnel where there are so many obstacles and we can barely see light. So we keep tripling and we keep falling down, but we just keep standing up and walk slowly. Um, for me, hope lies in people. Um, many journalists left, but many more stayed, even though they don't have resources. They have a social media account, um, even though they don't have a cameraman with them, they have their cell phone. Um, they go into the courtroom listening to um, all those cases that are being forgotten by the society. Um, they try to take information with um, scarce uh, available resources for public consumption. Uh, many of them do stick to that high spirit of journalism and do things under extremely difficult circumstance. For them, they haven't, give, they haven't give up, given up. And for me, I just don't have um, the right to do so um, as people who are literally in the much more dangerous uh, position. They are still um, like persisting. Um, and I do remember that uh, there are many of the journalists, uh, columnists who have been posting about commentary um, about the government that they just stayed in Hong Kong and wait for the day that the police knock on their door at uh, 5, 6 a.m. and tell them they are under arrest. Um, they just feel calm and peaceful through that process because they understand that um, by demonstrating that um, just by writing a commentary, the government would arrest them. It reflects and re reinforce um, how bad um, the government is and how how much they are getting anxious about a free media and um, in, uh, and, and circulation of information. So that's definitely the reason why we are all sticking together. We are all trying to kind of um, protecting the very limited civil space that we have. And uh, most often um, uh, we, we just have to um, look at each other and try to find support from each other and try to find hope from those people who are still persisting. And, and all those millions of people who, who risked beatings and jailing um, to march in the umbrella movement, how are they coping now? What's, what's life like for them? Life has been difficult. Um, the colour yellow is a resemblance of the whole movement and I just met a friend yesterday and she told me that people are just too scared to wear a yellow scarf, yellow hat, yellow umbrella, that anything that makes the government or the people reminding them about the movement and whenever they have a yellow umbrella in the city centre and everyone looks at them in a weird way, it feels like um, that kind of fear and chilling effect and white terror has internalized into the society. And I think people with conscience are really suffering from these kind of atmosphere. But I, I do feel like many of them still persist that glimpse of hope that uh, the totalitarian model from the Chinese Party is not sustainable. The way that they suppress everything would eventually result in a big bounce and for them, their economic power would not be as uh, strong as before 
and the way that they expand their authoritarianism is being more aware and recognized in the international level. They will have a tough role for the decade ahead. And when that system is not sustainable, then there is a chance that things could turn around. David, um, when you look at this um, move towards authoritarianism around the world, and you've seen it in some of the countries that you've been uh, Tanzania, um, do you agree with Nathan? Do you think that, um, do you see hope that down, down the road, people's desire for freedom and liberty will actually win out? I think this is the great question. And I think for us to consider it, we need to focus much more on the experience of the recipient of the information ecosystem. I guess we're all creators and recipients of information at this point with the internet. But my theory is that a lot of the um, desire for quote unquote rule of law or more authoritarian government is a reaction to such swift, rapid change and feeling um, just lost, dislocated in the world because there is so much information and so overwhelming where we create meaning in our lives, where we feel like we have something that we can contribute to, where we have shared values with our community members. It's really difficult to to come to narratives, to come to an understanding of our place in the world in the current information ecosystem. So this is another reason why I think it's important for media organizations to develop long-lasting relationships with their readers, with their audience, in a way where the audience is willing to pay something for it, because it also helps bring together a community and a, a common worldview and understanding that hopefully supports well-being, egalitarianism, and and the basic dignity of all of us, which I don't think is partisan. I think we can all agree about those values, but um, it's, be, you know, the, the fever, the, the pitch, the tone of media and, and the information ecosystem is, is a startling place right now. I, I absolutely agree, and I think uh, this, this idea that the media has, has a role to play in actually um, improving trust and, and persuading the population that they're worth fighting for is a, is a good place to end. So thank you so much, David. Thank you so much to Nathan. Um, good luck and best wishes to you. And, and thank you to Desera, who's left, and to SEMA and Project Syndicate for hosting this. Thank you.